They're in every home in America and they sell everything from A to Z. They have a network of warehouses all across the USA in every major city, but they can even reach into the rural pockets of America too. They have a fleet of vehicles to deliver everything right to your doorstep. I mean, this is a company that everybody knows. They have brand recognition. Almost everyone shops there or has shopped there at some point in their life. You know who I'm talking about. No, not Amazon. I'm talking about a company that existed 125 years ago. His name was Sears Roebuck and Company. I mean, this is a company that through the Sears catalog reached into every home across the USA, had a, a network of warehouses, a fleet of vehicles, everything could be delivered right to your doorstep. I mean, it's amazing. They were the original entrepreneurs, the forward thinkers of their day. They devised a strategy to get their product into every home in America, and it worked, and it worked for more than 100 years. And the way they did that is through the Sears catalog. I mean, the catalog had everything. It had food, it had drugs. You know, you could get opium back in those days through the Sears catalog. I mean, they have clothing, they have furniture, they have accessories, they even have vehicles. And through the Sears catalog, you could even buy a house. Talk about being forward thinking. I mean, Amazon just delivers to your doorstep. Sears would deliver your doorstep to you. I mean, some assembly required, of course. The thing that kills me about all of this is Sears is no more. I mean, I'm standing at an abandoned Sears building right now. I mean, the doors are locked, the lights are off. How did a company that was, were the original entrepreneurs, that really were the, the forward thinkers of their day, how did they get beaten at their own game? I mean, they had the infrastructure, they had the product, they had as much if not more than Amazon currently has, but still they're in bankruptcy. A lot of questions, right? I mean, did they ride out the big box concept too long? Was it corporate greed that took Sears down? Were they too slow to adapt to a digital age? Were they not diverse enough in their products? The bankruptcy courts will eventually render an autopsy for Sears and why it went down. But as I got to thinking about Sears, I started thinking of churches because you know, this happens in churches too. You can go from the center of Dallas and out through the suburbs and you can find a lot of monoliths now of, of, of buildings that used to be that are just, the lights are off and the doors are locked. Some of these buildings eventually get repurposed but many of them just sit on the corner and they slowly decay. How does a church keep from becoming a relic of the past? How do we make sure that we are staying abreast of what God is doing today, that we don't ride out a successful paradigm to the point that we actually are blinded by our success and we lose everything that we've gained? That's a question, not just for the capital C church, but it's a question for Spring Creek Church, and it's a question that we want to explore in this series. Yeah, you know, Sears for 100 years was so successful. You know they sold 70,000 houses through the Sears catalog? I mean, you better check under the doormat, see if it says Kenmore. You know, I mean, I don't know. But, but they were a huge success, but Sears is now no more. There's a lot of businesses that don't stay abreast of changing times and people and needs and markets, and as a result, they don't survive. And while it's true that churches are not businesses, there are some things we can learn from their failures that can help us as a church. So let's just begin right now with a word of prayer. Father, we are so grateful for this incredible time. We've had to just lift our voices in song and praise your name. To be reminded, God, that you are here in a powerful way already. You're at work. And you're going to continue that work right now as we worship around your word. We want to meet with you today. So, God, our hearts are open. Your welcome mat is out. And we just say, come in, Lord, and do in us what needs to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the church is in a business. You know, we don't, we don't exist by a profit motive. Greed doesn't dominate our value system. We're not fundamentally selling anything. But like Sears and these other big retailers that have closed their doors and turned off their lights, there's something to be learned from their failure to adapt to changing times and changing needs of a generation. 
Now, don't misunderstand me. There are some things that are non-negotiable, that are not up for change, like the timeless Word of God. We're not going to change the Word of God, try to make it more palatable to a new generation, even though there are some churches that are doing just that. But our methods and our programs and the way we share God's message must be constantly reevaluated and adapted to where people are at and the needs they have. I mean, this is what Paul was writing about in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He's our example. He said, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous, moral, loose living, immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience from their, things from their point of view. I've become every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. What this verse is telling us in pure and simple terms is that Paul adapted. He changed to meet his audience. He got inside their shoes. He saw things from their perspective. He led with empathy. And this is the same calling on the church today. That we have to be able to get inside the shoes of those that we mean to reach, to see and to feel and experience life from their perspective so that we can meet them with this timeless message in the word of God, of God's great love for people. Here's the deal. People don't like change. Even though change is inevitable and you can't resist it, I mean, change is happening all around us. People change. Even the way God works changes over time. And if churches fail to adapt, we don't just miss out on reaching the next generation. We miss out on the movement of God. It reminds me of what uh, Harold Wilson, he was the two-time prime minister of the United Kingdom. He said this, he who rejects change is the architect of decay. The only human institution which rejects pro progress is a cemetery. In other words, to refuse to change is to join the dead. If I believe that, that literally I'm not to change and I'm not to adapt, then really what happens is my faith and my relationship with God becomes dead too because I come to believe that God stopped working and inspiring and leading years ago. Now, don't misunderstand. It's good to have a past. It's good to cherish the past. It's great and it's wonderful to have traditions. The Bible encourages us to remember the past, but only as a springboard to the future. So I first want to show you that God won't be contained by the old ways of yesterday because this is what Jesus taught us. He said as much in Luke chapter 5, verse 38. Jesus once said, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. So get this. In the Old Testament, new wine is really shorthand or synonymous with the blessings of God. I'll give you a few examples of this. Deuteronomy 33. So Israel will live in safety. Jacob will dwell secure in a land of grain and new wine with the heaven, uh, where the heavens drop dew. The prophet Joel said, the Lord replied to them, I'm sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will you be an object of scorn to the nations. Even the prophet Jeremiah. They will rejoice in the bounty the Lord, the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil, the young, young of the flocks and the herds, they will be a well-watered garden, and they will sorrow no more. I mean, I could go on, but you get the idea. In an agrarian society like Israel, when you had new wine, that meant that God was pouring out his blessings on your people. You had an abundance of grain. You had an abundance of the good stuff. And typically, when the people of God were under discipline, it was a withdrawing of the new wine. And the harvests weren't as great. So you understand Jesus is talking about new wine, the blessings of God that pour out on our life. But to really understand Jesus, you also have to understand how wine was made in the first century. So let's look at that. Let's look at making wine in Jesus' day. So the process of turning grapes into wine requires this process called ferment fermentation. And as, grapes, as grape juice ferments, what happens is it turns some of the sugar in the grapes into alcohol. Now, turning sugar into alcohol produces a byproduct called carbon dioxide. Now, this happens with all sorts of alcohol, any form of alcohol, whether you're making beer or you're making wine, the byproduct is carbon dioxide. Now, today, what, what uh, beer and winemakers have is an airlock. 
so that when that juice begins to produce the carbon dioxide, they can let the carbon dioxide out without letting air in because if air goes in, it destroys the wine, okay? That's the way it works. But in Jesus' day, they didn't have airlocks. They couldn't just release the carbon dioxide. So what they would do is they would skin a goat and then use the skin of the goat as a way to uh, a container for the wine as it fermented. Because you see that the skin of the goat was elastic when it was first killed. And you can see how they kind of shut off the legs, the arm, the neck. And they poured all the wine in there. And then as it begins to ferment over two to four months, that wine skin would expand. Which is great, which is wonderful. But you could never reuse that wine skin. Because once it had been stretched, all the elasticity was gone. So if you had new wine and you tried to reuse an old wine skin, what would happen is it would let off carbon dioxide again, but there would be no room for that skin to give, and it would just break open, and you would lose all of the wine. So Jesus' point is this. When God pours out his new wine, read his new blessings, old systems and old structures, old ways of thinking and being, Old styles of ministry and doing church are not going to be able to contain the new thing that God is doing. Now, that doesn't mean that old systems and structures were bad or wrong. It just means they contain the blessing of God and they serve the purpose of God in their time. They contained it in a season. But because God's doing a new thing, he needs a new container to, so that nothing is lost in terms of what God is doing. Now, specifically in this case, Jesus is addressing the old wine of Judaism. Or as my next point says, Judaism was the cradle of Christianity, and it almost became her coffin. So in the immediate context, understand, Jesus is the new thing that God is doing. And his presence signaled the passing of the old. You see, Jesus has no intention of patching and pouring his ministry into the old wineskin of Judaism. Judaism had become so labored down and accumulated centuries of non-biblical tradition and rules. In other words, Jesus didn't come to reform an old system. He came to bring something radically new. Or like Jonathan Martin, he's a Christian author and speaker. He said, I can think of no more miserable vocation than spending your whole life trying to repair old wineskins that God by the Spirit intends to burst. So this concept goes beyond just the first century and Jesus being the new blessing of God and a new thing God was doing. This has happened throughout our history as a church. So let me just give you a few examples of that. The Protestant Reformation happened 500 years ago. It was a breath of, of, of God, a new renewal of his church came through Martin Luther, and Martin Luther was deeply moved by the Spirit of God to begin something radically new, to, to throw off the shackles of traditionalism and, and the selling of forgiveness to say, no, this is not the way of God. A new thing God was doing needed a new wineskin. Billy Graham, back in 1949 in Los Angeles, was the first preacher to ever rent a stadium for a revival or evangelistic meeting. Did you know that? And when he did that, he was ruthlessly criticized. People said, this is not the way we do it. We don't do church in sports stadiums, right? And so he, it's, it's a new wineskin, and people don't understand it. They resist the change. But because he chose to rent these huge stadiums, and because of the publicity it got, Billy Graham became not only the most recognized evangelistic preacher in history, but also the most respected. But the best part of it is he reached some 210 million people that way in 185 different countries. God was doing a new thing. God was pouring it through Billy Graham and the Billy Graham Association. And God was bringing a, fresh, a refreshing to all of America and all around the world through Billy Graham. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was another man of God who sought a new wineskin to begin a work of justice. Dr. King embraced new and controversial method of resistance called nonviolence, of course, inspired by Jesus Christ. He started bus, scott, boy, uh, I'm sorry, bus boycotts. He, he started um, and inspired these sit-ins at lunch counters, both in South Carolina and in Nashville. He braved marches where, uh, where demonstrators were sprayed with water hoses and beaten with clubs and attacked by dogs. He rejected the use of violence in all of its form, and he preached love, even love for his enemies. Dr. King was ruthlessly criticized and misunderstood, but he accomplished so much for the kingdom of God. God had a new wineskin and a calling for Dr. King to do things a new way. Now, this is often the pattern. When God brings a new wineskin into play, many people just don't get it. 
They criticize the new wineskin. They say, you know, the old wineskin is good enough, and the old wine is better. That's what we want. We don't want the new wineskin. People have a lot of difficulty when it comes to change. Lyle Schaller said the church especially, and he said this, the initial reaction of most people to a proposal to change will be negative. I believe that. I believe that when you talk about change, when you begin to change things up, all the critics come out, right? I mean, they just start, hey, I don't like that. It doesn't matter if you're changing things at home and the rules with the kids or whether you're changing things at school or changing things in business or in the church, people are going to resist it. Now, I sincerely believe that Jesus is wanting to pour out a fresh set of blessings on Spring Creek Church. And I believe because of that, it's going to require a new wineskin. I believe that God is going to do some things in this church, and maybe in the future it's going to look and feel a little bit different than the way we've done things in the past. You see, over the last couple of years specifically, we've been having a lot of conversations as pastors and with the, the board here saying, you know, we don't want to be a single-generation church. We don't want to reach just people like us. We want to reach all the generations for Christ. And so as a result, we said we need a commitment to get younger. Now, the moment we said that, believe me, people started saying, well, does that mean there's no place for me anymore? Because I'm older and I've got gray hair. Hey, listen, i got no hair and they still have a place for me. All right? we got a place for you. We're not putting you out the pasture. What we're saying is we want to diversify our leadership and be more inclusive in our fellowship and make sure that the young people that are serving with us are having a voice in the direction of the church because I don't want to shepherd this church for my generation and see it die. I want to see this church go on. Because I tell you, church, I'm just getting back from Ecuador, and people in Ecuador, they know your name, and they know the reputation of this church, and they know how we do global missions, and they believe in what we're doing. I want that influence, both locally and globally, to continue. So as a result, over the last couple of years, we've been slow and we've been intentional in building a team. And I think you would probably all agree with me that Pastors Josh and Patrick and Alan and Diana and Eric are really top shelf kind of leaders that we are fortunate to have. And I want you to know as a leader that all of these people, as we come together, they all have say-so. They all talk to me. They all have feedback on our direction and what we're doing here because we want to create a, a, a shared relationship vision for the future. Now, most of you know I did this with another church when I first moved here. I moved here 34 years ago. I've been your pastor 29 years, but I moved here 34 years ago. And 34 years ago, I pastored a tiny Baptist church in South Garland on Kingsley Road. And that was a single generation church. And it was dying. Like what we see in the film, it was a dying church. People were not coming anymore. It was just slowly tapering off to nothing. I was there for four and a half years. And I helped them to understand their vision was wonderful. They wanted to reach this community. They wanted to reach Garland for Christ. But God had a new wineskin that was coming. And that meant that the old ways were going to die. But you see, dying in the economy of God is not a bad thing because Jesus said, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it's never going to live again. So that vision had to die so that God could birth Spring Creek out of that vision. And this church started back in September 1990 out of that church that willingly gave all. I mean, literally everything they'd saved, all the money that was in their property, they gave it all to start this church. They laid our foundation, and it was a great foundation. But it was a new generation, and God wanted to do something new, and he needed a new wineskin. And I believe God's getting ready to do it again. So let's honor the past and let's celebrate all the ways God's been faithful to us to get us to this point. This is God's church. He sets our agenda. He sets the direction. It's our decision to follow him. And let's get involved in helping to make this church everything that God meant it to be. Now, I know the moment you start talking about change, the fear cranks up for everybody because that's always the first reaction to change, any word of change. I want to show you, I want to talk to you about islands of stability. In particular, we need islands of stability in the midst of change. Some of you right now in this room, apart from the changes Spring Creek will be going through over the next several years, you're going through a time of great upheaval in your life, a lot of change. Maybe this is a brand new community. Maybe this is your first time at Spring Creek. And just everything has changed, and you're trying to make new relationships. Maybe it is that, that, that things at work, I mean, it's just kind of scary and you just feel like you're just one pink slip away from just being out of work and you're not quite sure what you would do. For some of you, it's in your marriage. For some of you, it's with your kids. But it's a time of great upheaval. I think about Alvin Toffler. 
He, he wrote the classic book on change called Future Shock. He said this, when people go through rapid times of change, they need islands of stability. So the one consistency of life is change, but the one thing we must have in the midst of change are things that don't change. And there are three things that never change. The first one is this, God's love never changes. And James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. Same verse in the Phillips translation, with God there's never the slightest variation or shadow of inconsistency. Or how about this, about as plain as it gets, I the Lord do not change. Now the theological term for that is the immutability of God. That God never changes, he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. Why does God never change? Is he stuck in his ways? Does he not want to change? Can he not change? No, the reason God doesn't change is because he's perfect. And if you're perfect, you can't get any better and you can't get any worse. You're just exactly what you're supposed to be. So God never changes because he's perfect. Now, in addition, the Bible says that you and I were created as an object of God's love. You were made to be loved by God. The Bible teaches that God loves you on your good days and your bad days. God loves you when you feel lovable and when you don't feel lovable. God loves you even when you're walking in disobedience, and God loves you when you're walking in obedience. God loves you all the time because it's not based on your performance. It's based on his character, and his character is unchanging. His commitment to you is love, and so his love never dims. In fact, what the Bible says is your love never changes. The point is you're never going to be loved by God any more than you are in this moment, and you're never going to be loved by God any less. None of that changes because it's based on who God is. Second thing that's never going to change, I can count on God's love. God's word will never change. Isaiah 48, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God shall stand forever. The word of God is timeless. It's eternal. It's enduring. It's always fresh. It never gets stale. I believe in the word of God. God's word is never out of date. The Bible says, long ago I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. And Jesus, our king, our master, and our rabbi, He said, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So if you need stability in your life, you need God's unchanging truth. You know, there are people today that believe they're being faithful to the word of God and they throw away the entire Old Testament. And, you know, this is, this is the Bible Jesus loved. This is the Bible Jesus quoted. This is, the, this is the, the Bible the Old Testament is quoted hundreds of times in the New Testament. Jesus said about that book, about the Old Testament, that not one jot, not one tittle, which are the smallest strokes of a pen in the Hebrew language, not one jot or one tittle would pass away from the Word of God. And yet they think they're loving Jesus by throwing away the Old Testament. Or there are some Christians who think they're really smart, and they say, well, I just believe the red letters, you know, the things that Jesus spoke and none of the rest. Well, you love the red letters, but you love the red letters in the book of Revelation because he speaks there too. And usually those words are pretty inconsistent with, you know, what your theology is. I believe in the word of God. And I'll tell you this, the more I study this book, the more amazed I am by its amazing congruity. That, that God put this together in this amazing way. And each part supports the other part. It's an, it's an incredible book. It's a great foundation for life. So God's love for you is never changing. His word's not going to change. Here's one more thing. God's purpose for my life will never change. 1 Samuel 15, 29, God is not a man. God does not change his mind. I'm glad for that verse because long before you and I were born, God planned you. And his plan for your life, your purpose has never changed. Now, our plans change all the time, don't they? Why do our plans change? Because we can't see the future. Things happen that we didn't anticipate. I can't even see tomorrow, let alone 10 years from now, but something happens. i got to change my plans. Or I make a plan that's a great plan, but I don't have the power, I don't have the money, I don't have the resources, don't have the energy, don't have the intelligence to make it happen. My plans change all the time, but how about God? Does anything ever catch God by surprise? No. God's omniscient. He knows everything. So he, he's never caught off guard, and God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. That means he always has the power to do everything he set out to do. So if God is all-powerful and God is all-knowing, nothing catches him by surprise. He's able to do what he chooses to do. That means his plans for you never change. Psalm thirty-three, eleven: his plans endure forever. His purposes last eternally. What I'm saying is, is no matter what's happened in your life, I mean, think about the most embarrassing thing you've ever done. Think about your deepest regret. 
Think about the most profound hurt that somebody else has done to you. Think about the things that, that threw you off course, made you quit school, made you, made you take another choice, made, maybe made your marriage tank. I mean, whatever it was. Let me ask you this. Did God know that was going to happen before it happened? Well, of course he did. God didn't make it happen. He knew it would happen. He knew it would happen, but he didn't make it happen. And the Bible says God works all things for our good and our growth. Amen? God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. God is going to work everything that's happened in your life into the plan for your life. God knew that before it would happen. So what that means is you're still on plan A. You realize that? There's no plan B with God. Not a God who knows everything, can do everything. You're still on plan A. Because God already anticipated those things happening, wove them into the plan of God for your life. And so that means that no matter what's happening, no matter what today holds or tomorrow holds, what's been done to me or what I've done to others, I can count on God's love never changing for me. That God's truth is a foundation upon which I can build my life. And his purpose is never side railed or derailed by anything that anybody's ever done to me or anything I've ever done to somebody else. God is true. So let's return to this idea and talk about the early church and how it struggled with change. So the book of Acts is kind of the hinge point of the New Testament. It's a book that reminds us that change is nothing new for the people of God. The story I want to share with you is about Peter. Peter's hungry. He's waiting for a meal to be prepared. He falls into a, a trance and God spoke to him about something that would be a significant change. Peter's going to do something he's never had to do before. But up to this point, he's been in his comfort zone. Now, all of us have our comfort zones. We prefer our comfort zones. But let me tell you something about comfort zones. You're never challenged in the comfort zone. When you stay in your comfort zone, you don't even have to have faith anymore. And the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So I, I stay in my comfort zone, and I start thinking, you know, uh, this is where I like to be, and I just want to kind of stay in this one place, but I'm not really living by faith. I'm not challenged, I don't have to struggle, I don't have to grow. Which means comfort zones have kind of become a prison. In prison, you don't have to make a lot of decisions because they're made for you. Don't have to worry about what I'm going to wear tomorrow. I already know what that is, right? I know what, I know what the meal's going to be. I know where it's going to be served. Don't have to worry about paying my bills. It's one of the reasons that some prisoners return to prison because they found security there. Life is predictable in prison. The prison that was designed for their punishment becomes their security or like in the movie Shawshank Redemption, remember the character Red? He said, these walls are funny. First you hate them, then you get used to them. Enough time passes, you get so you depend on them. That's the danger of comfort zone living. Is I get in a place where I just, I'm catered to and I like everything that I'm experiencing here. I don't like to be challenged. I don't have to like getting out of my comfort zone. But it becomes a prison. It robs me of faith. It robs me of the things that God wants to do in my life. So back to this story. We often think of Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles, and he was, but Peter, the apostle to the Jews, Jesus' secondhand man, this guy is the one who really validated the ministry to the Gentiles. So when you open the book of Acts, you see the first church. It's a vibrant community. People are following Jesus. But fundamental to the story, at the beginning of the book of Acts, it's a Jewish community. They're still eating kosher food. They're still reciting Jewish prayers. They're still observing Torah. These are Jewish people following a Jewish Messiah who lived a Jewish life in a Jewish nation. That's who they were. And it never occurred to them to be anything else until God began to pour out new wine. And that new wine was Gentiles who were flocking into the church like it never happened before. So the first thing that happens, it messes with their idea of purity. So we have this purity code in the Old Testament where God would tell the people of Israel, I want you to come out and be separate. I want you to be holy. So it's its fundamental definition to be holy meant to be separate. And so God told these families, I want you to leave your land, your culture, your families. God, I want to teach you to live and be in a different kind of way. God was going to separate these people so that ultimately all the peoples of the earth would be connected to him. That was the purpose of the Abrahamic covenant. So if you read the Old Testament, there's a lot of rules, aren't there? Touch this, don't touch that. Eat this, don't eat that. Wash that, don't wash this. Over the years, Israel tended to lose the big picture about what God was trying to teach them in that. They began to think of holiness as being exclusive. So they began to exclude people. They shut certain people out. They wouldn't associate 
with women because women have a monthly period and that made them unclean. And they wouldn't associate with tax collectors because they were sellouts to the Romans. And they wouldn't associate with lepers because they had a skin condition that rendered them unclean. They wouldn't associate with anybody who didn't follow their dietary laws, which means all the Gentiles were excluded. If you married as a Jewish person, you married a Gentile, the Jewish community would have a funeral for you because you'd be dead to them. If you saw, and this is in the rabbinical writings of the time, if you saw a Gentile woman in the pains of childbirth, you were not to help her because it only meant another Gentile was coming into the world. That's how deep the hatred and this prejudice ran. It was strong. You, you know, you wouldn't be guests in their home. You wouldn't invite them into your home. Of course, this has nothing to do with the Old Testament because the Old Testament never told the Jewish people to have no contact with Gentiles. This is something that had just kind of been added onto their faith. So God gives Peter this vision. The vision happens at Joppa, which is an important factor I'll bring in at the end of the message. Here's what God does. He became hungry, that's Peter, wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And a voice told him, get up, Peter, eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So in this dream, in this trance-like state, God says to Peter, I know you've been thinking about separation about what makes animals clean and unclean, and more particularly, what makes people clean and unclean. But the, all those old ceremonial food laws, they're lifted. And the barrier to the Gentile world is completely gone. So Peter's vision has two points. First of all, all the food laws are fulfilled in Jesus. This is why we can enjoy a good BLT these days, right? Because there's no more forbiddens against, uh, against pork. It's really good stuff. The second thing... The thing that separates us from the nations, they're not to be considered unclean or common anymore. Why? Because Jesus' blood has, in effect, cleansed them all. The need for the distinction between clean and unclean is no longer needed. So right after this vision, men from a, a, a man, he's, he's a captain in the Roman army, a centurion, his name is Cornelius. Men from this house come to Peter and say, uh, Cornelius would like to see you. And he's, he's a centurion in the Roman army. Now, immediately that would throw up red flags to Peter. Because this is not just a Gentile, but he's a part of the oppressing army, right? So th these are people that Jews kind of naturally hated. But Peter goes. He goes to Cornelius' house. And when Cornelius sees him, he invites him into his home. How many times up to this point in his life do you think Peter has been invited into the home of a Gentile? Never. It's never happened before. And he knows if he walks through that door, things are going to change in his life forever. And he does. And when he goes in, he tells Cornelius, here's the good news. A man named Jesus came, sent by God, went around doing good, healing many. We saw him crucified one day. Three days later, he rose again. I was there. I saw him. By his death and resurrection, forgiveness is available to all. We thought it was just for us, but we're now beginning to understand it's for everybody. And once he preaches this message, the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and all those in the house. And we have this repeat of Pentecost where that God is saying, these people are my family. And then Peter makes this amazing statement. He says, I now realize how true it is. That God does not show favoritism. You see, this chapter is often referred to as the conversion of Cornelius, and it was. But at a deeper level, it was the conversion of Peter. It was Peter finally coming to understand that grace trumps race. Amen? Grace trumps race. He began to see he was held captive by his prejudice, by his exclusivity, by his racism, and all of that gets scraped away because God's pouring out a new blessing, new wine, and it needs a new wine skin. The old wine skin of Judaism was not enough, wasn't big enough, wasn't elastic enough, would not contain the blessing that God wanted to pour out. So one more thing and I'll wrap up. This is a repetition of a call. It's one of the things that Luke loves to do. Luke loves to take an Old Testament story and lay it alongside a New Testament story. When we talked about the Holy Spirit, I told you how that Pentecost was really a repeat of the giving of the law of Mount Sinai. If you remember in my book, I talk about how Ananias and Sapphira is really a repeat of the story of Adam and Eve in the first temptation. Well, this story in particular, 
Because I mentioned a name. Where did this happen? It happened at Joppa. Joppa is only mentioned one other time in the Bible. 800 years prior, a guy named Jonah. Remember this prophet? And God comes to him while he's at Joppa and says, I want you to go to Assyria and preach to them the good news. I want you to go and preach to them. Jonah doesn't want to do it. Why? Because they're Gentiles. I don't want to carry God's message to Gentiles. And so all of a sudden, you know, he doesn't want to go, so God has to discipline his prophet. Remember the great fish and swallows him? And when he's in the belly of the great fish, he begins to pray. He says, dear God, I'll do anything you want. Just get me out of here, but let me go out the same way I came in. <laughs> now, he actually didn't pray that, but I, I think if I was in the fish, <laughs> I'd be praying that. Because there's really only two ways out of that fish. <laughs> and out the mouth is the better way. So anyway, he prays and God lets him do it. But he, when, even after he does it, and the people of God, these Gentiles, they respond amazingly to the message, right? The whole city repents. I mean, even the cows repent. I mean, you're really good when you can get cows, bovine repentance. I mean, that's amazing. But that happens. But Jonah, he goes out and sulks after that. His heart is not in it. So here's the deal. The call comes again, and now it's Peter. It's another one of God's servants. And he's telling him, go preach to the Gentiles. What I'm here to tell you is this. Is Peter's not only obedient where Jonah was not. But God's message in 800 years had not changed. He wants his lost sheep found. As you know, 2,000 years have passed since Peter received that message in Joppa. And that message comes again to Garland, Texas. And he says, I want my lost sheep found. I don't care how old, how young they are. I want all people everywhere to know me. I want my family to be as big and as broad as humanity is. And I want to be that kind of leader that helps to make that happen. And I'm going to share that leadership with young people who help us to get there. So I hope you're all in on this church. I think that God has great things in store for us. I think God's getting ready to pour out new wine in abundance. We have to be willing to shed an old wineskin or two. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your amazing truth. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in this place. I know, God, that you're real. I know I can count on your love. I can count on your word. I can count on your purpose. And I pray, God, that as the people of God, we would hear Jesus, our master, saying, I'm pouring out new wine. Will you prepare the new wineskin to contain the blessing of God? In your name I pray. Amen.